I wish everybody was like you. Okay. Um, does this sound okay? Mm -hmm. All right, good. So uh, thanks, Piero, for having me out, and thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, as Piero said, my name is Shane Denson. I'm associate professor here in art and art history. Um, so let me just jump into it. Uh, my book, Post-Cinematic Bodies, asks a set of questions about contemporary life and our relations to technology. Most fundamentally, how is human embodiment transformed in an age of algorithms? How do contemporary media technologies, such as AI, VR, smartphones, and robotics, to name just a few, how do they target and reshape our bodies? And what difference can art make? To answer these questions, I move between mainstream and commercial devices and platforms, and contemporary artists working with and against those technologies. For example, I write about objects like the Peloton bike and the Apple Watch, both of which capture information about our bodies, turning our metabolisms into valuable data that can be tracked and visualized for the benefit of the, of the user, but that can also be bought and sold to the highest bidder, for example, to online advertisers or insurance companies. In these exchanges, which are kept squarely out of sight of consumers, Metabolic processes intermix with algorithmic ones. The intervention can go unnoticed because the data itself, such as caloric expenditures, average heart rate, or long-term behavioral trends, these often escape conscious awareness. They're simply matters of habit or simply uh, below the, the threshold of perception. Meanwhile, the algorithmic processing of the data is completely black boxed and unavailable to our perception. And since our biodata is not just recorded and analyzed, but serves as the basis for real-time predictive operations, the mingling of metabolism and algorithm represents a deep intervention in the lived experience of having and being a body. As I argue, the contemporary media landscape characterized by smart devices and systems subtly transforms our bodies and our relations um, our embodied relations to the environment. So what I mean is this. The new algorithmic media operating predictively and at microtemporal speeds, often at the scale of nanoseconds, bypass our consciousness to take aim at bodily processes, exposing them to predictive shaping. So let me spell this out in a little bit more detail. Computational operations take place faster than the blink of an eye outside the window of human perception, and they operate on the embodied substratum of perception. They're therefore able to get ahead of consciousness, slotting our bodies and minds into grooves that are traced out for them in advance. In this connection, I'm most worried about the way algorithms standardize perception and action, threatening human diversity. If the existentialists claimed that existence precedes essence, in other words, that there is no human nature, no fixed human nature, and each of us is free to forge our own essence, which is also a daunting weight and ethical responsibility, then these new technologies threaten to upset this balance by preempting our decision-making agencies and slotting us predictively into typified schemas. Basically, new essences might be engineered and implemented algorithmically, in the microtemporal interval between stimulus and response before we can even blink, much less think. That might sound like science fiction, but think of the way these feedback processes are already operative in something mundane like selfies made with Snapchat filters. <clears throat> Holding the smartphone at arm's length, we look at ourselves in a virtual mirror, which in real time shows us an augmented image maybe our face overlaid with bunny ears or a big mustache or some other playful transformation. All of these filters depend on bodily norms, such as what a face typically looks like. And some of them, like de-aging filters or uh, gen highly gendered beautifying filters, implement even more specific normative schemas, which intervene between myself and my recognition of myself in the virtual mirror. In this way, ableist, racist, and gender essentialist schemas come to serve as a real-time filter through which an embodied subject recognizes or misrecognizes themselves and perceives the world. Of course, this 
probably sounds a bit pessimistic, but throughout the book, I try to foreground the contingencies at the heart of these systems to show the occasions where a crack or a glitch appears and where we might turn things around and redirect these technologies towards better ends. And this is where art comes in. If aesthetics in its broad original sense is about sensation, it's precisely the aesthetic that gets left behind in the opaque black boxed processes that I've been describing. Artists working with these technologies therefore face the challenge of rendering what might be called their anesthetic dimensions sensible, making hidden infrastructures momentarily visible. An artist like Ian Chang takes up AI to produce a sort of self-playing video game. Uh, this, they have this at the Cantor. It's not on display right now, but the Cantor here owns a copy of this. Um, viewers watch this self-playing game repeatedly attempt and fail to achieve its objectives. In the process, they come to feel an acute awareness of the interactive potential that they expect from such spectacles, but that without a game, a, a game controller or input device has been denied to them. This opens a space of bodily disorientation and a vantage from which we can start to take stock of the embodied habits associated with computation. Media artist Hito Shiro pushes further, investigating the formatting of embodiment through a playfully self-reflexive video installation about motion capture, itself set in a motion capture studio. She suggests circuits that connect the abstraction of movement from human bodies to the modeling of motion in video games, to the automated recognition and targeting of bodies by way of computer vision algorithms in military drones. Against these logics, artist Rashad Newsom <laughs> deploys AI and motion capture towards more ameliorative ends. His project Being, which he worked on as an artist in residence here at the Human Centered AI Institute, allows users to interact with an ambiguously gendered and racialized robotic avatar inspired by both West African and African American cultures. Taking a special inspiration from queer black ballroom dance cultures, a central spectacle is that of the robotic body dancing on a virtual dance floor. As Newsom emphasizes, custom motion capture was necessary because black dance styles were not available in existing motion capture libraries. This is thus an attempt to develop what he calls a counter-hegemonic algorithm for feminist and black interests. These and other artists attempt to re-engineer the bodily norms and schemas at work in algorithmic media. Though they can't dismantle the invisible systems that now ubiquitously aim to track and predict our behavior, they sometimes manage to momentarily disrupt those circuits, helping us to feel, if not quite comprehend, the ways that embodied existence is up for grabs. So I'll end with a somewhat more detailed analysis of a contemporary artist working at the intersection of metabolic and algorithmic media. Mexican-Canadian artist Rafael Lozano Hemmer's Pulse series turns the largely invisible and private tactility of heartbeats into spectacularly public biodata. For example, Pulse Index from 2010 invites participants to place their finger into a custom sensor and observe their fingerprint and pulse being registered in a massive, larger-than-life image projected on the gallery wall, the largest of many such images arrayed in grids of increasing density that wrap around the room. The interactive installation displays the, the pulsing fingerprints of the last 10,952 participants arranged in a Fibonacci distribution from right, the current image nearest the sensor, to left, where thousands of tiny prints are queued up on a giant wall waiting their turn to disappear from view. The sensor, which combines a 220-time digital microscope with a heart rate sensor, thus feeds the participants biometric data into a large-scale display that intimates one's entry into a seriality that begins with the expropriation of tactile information from the body and ends with its withdrawal from view. Or rather, this is where the possibility of aesthetic engagement with the image ends. But the disappearance of the visual form 
does not necessarily signal its expungement from the machine-readable database. Presumably, the latter continues to accrue more and more data points, just like corporations and government agencies that don't even have the courtesy to show us an image of the anonymous collectives into which they aggregate us. Thus, the spectacular display of pulsing fingerprints progressing from the close-up of my own print, with which I'm encouraged to identify by means of the real-time imaging and the sheer size of the image, to those of the anonymous masses about to recede into the black box, provides a dramatic, perhaps even sublime, view of the otherwise invisible correlations and discorrelations that drive our metabolic society. In an earlier work, Pulse Room, from 2005, Lozano Himmer uses heart rate sensors like the ones on treadmills and other exercise machines to measure blood flow in participants' hands. These sensors provide input for hundreds of clear light bulbs, all of which pulsate to the rhythm of someone else's heart. The formal seriality is similar to that of Pulse Index, the work I showed you a moment ago, but the representational dimension is downplayed since there's no video image involved. Because one's pulse is translated into pure non-representational light, the effect can be more environmental and less focused on individual differences between fingerprints, skin color, and other identifying marks. Entering into a room full of these lights, one could almost believe that the pulses are completely random, and yet the seriality is evident if one participates from the beginning of a new cycle, that is, after the system is newly rebooted. Grasping the sensors, one's pulse registers on the nearest light bulb. Letting go, the pulse is transferred to a single overhead bulb. When the next person takes hold of the sensors, their pulse similarly registers on the nearby, nearby monitor bulb and is then transferred away, pushing the pattern of the first one down the line. And so it goes until all of the bulbs are pulsating, creating a literal queue of illuminated heartbeats that will be extinguished when an additional participant joins. Driven by a computer that stores participants' heart rate data and addresses the individual light bulbs sequentially, the patterns that emerge can resemble a, a noisy digital system, operating quasi-stochastically according to binary oppositions of on and off. However, the analog dimming of the light bulb's filaments gestures towards the resistance and friction involved in translating material and embodied signals into digital information. Finally, the more recent pulse topology from 2021 expands these principles into an even more spectacular display consisting of anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 LED bulbs accompanied by audio traces of heart activity. Interestingly, this iteration operates with a touchless sensor, gathering heart rate data through photoplepismography, the same technology used in the Apple Watch's optical heart sensor and in the pulse oximeters that became familiar household objects during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. The latter devices might be seen as a sort of tactile camera that turns the optical, specular focus of a camera inwards back towards the primordial touch and tactility from which it originally sprang. Such devices operate an intriguing topological deformation. Bypassing subjective specularity, the lens in an oximeter or a smartphone camera is trained on a touching hand, or in Lozano Himmer's touchless sensors, on a hand whose touch is only imminent, never actual. The light rays penetrate the skin to register blood flow which is turned into data and translated back into a tactile environmental image. This bodily data, which Lozano Himmer refers to as, quote, our most intimate bio biometric, is turned into pulsing lights, too many to count. In the wake of the pandemic, the interactive work, quote, brings people together, especially after so many Zoom calls and being in your own bubble, according to the artist, who sees it both as a, quote, celebration of the fact we are all together making this artwork exist, but also as what he calls a memorial to the incredible loss that we've had. Foregrounding a sense of fragility, Lozano Himmer suggests that the seriality of the piece serves as something like a memento mori, 
at, quote, as new participants add their heartbeats and old participants disappear from the room. Accordingly, the social dimension activated by the piece is visualized but seen only obliquely as environmental gestalts. It's also heard but only as aggregated and de-individualized data. And it is felt existentially but never cognized or capitalized upon. In connection with its use of photoplethysmography, however, we might push on the artist's claims about the memorial function of the piece. While a powerful reminder of our embodied finitude, the eventual forgetting of a heartbeat does not address the differences among those temporarily remembered in these pulsing lights. All of them appear more or less indifferently as exteriorized traces of interior processes, and yet the mediality of the flesh in conjunction with mediating apparatuses such as the biosensors used here is hardly universal. Indeed, during the pandemic, it became widely known that photoplethysmographic devices like pulse oximeters were far from faithful or objective instruments. They worked better on lighter skin, quite poorly on darker skin. The relational nature of biodata includes dimensions of race and racialization, and such racial differences raise questions about who is memorialized and who cannot be in a work like Lozano Himmer's. Far from indicting his work for its lack of attention to such differences, my point is rather one about the piece's generative qualities, which far exceed the intentionality of an artist's statement. By foregrounding the biotechnical serialization processes at work in our metabolic cultures, pulse topology quite provocatively raises questions, whether intended or not, about typification processes ranging from normative conceptions of race and gender to disability. In this way, the installation turns the tools of correlative capture into a potentially powerful project of embodied counter-capture, forcing us to confront the differential and differentiating dimensions of contemporary algorithmically inflected embodiment, along with the varied conditions of subjective, affective, and collective existence that they enable. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Anybody have questions? At, at the end, eventually it all spools out, correct? None of the data is kept? Oh, yeah, in, in Lozano Himmler's work? Well, 